Welcome to the inhuman urban sprawl of Los Angeles County, California. A city built for the vehicle wheel and not for the human foot. With a barely functional transit system and sidewalks designed to be abseiled, Hollywood is as hostile to pedestrians as its movie studios are to new ideas. <laughs> Oh my god, it's Kingo! He's my favourite! That's why Santa Monica Beach was the perfect spot for dockless e-scooter rental companies to begin their first large-scale invasions of US soil. Since 2017, companies like Lime and Bird have established garrisons across the United States. And ever since their arrival, these dockless wonders have been dodging public safety legislation as quickly as they breeze through three-lane traffic. E-scooter haters, though, will argue that these things are nothing but 48-volt street trash that will part you with your front teeth and beg to be booted into the nearest body of water. Personally, I'm not sure how I feel about them, so let's have a look at e-scooters from both sides, and let's figure it out together. But first, where did scooters come from? The first motor-powered scooters hit streets all the way back in 1915. Developed as a transport solution during wartime oil shortages, the Autoped was a fuel-efficient micro-transport device that turned postal workers into gliding parcel slingers. And in an early example of influencer marketing, the Autoped was advertised to women by famous and wealthy suffragettes. Users were able to breeze through bombed-out European streets, outpacing any safety regulation and then disappearing before the invention of traffic lights. Throughout the next century, new scooters came and went, as the definition of what constituted a scooter changed dramatically. In the 21st century, there were attempts to improve upon the elegant kick scooter design with micro-transport monstrosities like the Segway. But it was the micro-scooter craze of the early 2000s that taught a generation to scoot again if they survived the ankle owies that they were famous for inflicting. The modern electric scooter, though, is really a Chinese innovation. Beijing tech giant Xiaomi were the first to make electric scooters viable, efficient, and popular. Instead of being powered by gas or foots, these new Sino scooters were powered by efficient lithium-ion batteries. What followed was an explosion in e-scooter demand, in spite of the many regular explosions that these scooters were causing. These scooters, though, were mostly just retail scooters that people were importing from China. It was Tencent executive Brad Bao who had the idea of dumping these lithium-ion battery bombs on every available street corner. Lime started with the vision of making our urban living much more livable. Lime has been devoted and committed to that vision. Founding Lime Scooter with Toby Sun in 2016, the San Francisco-based company started up with close ties with Chinese manufacturers. And Brad himself is actually a pretty rad guy, as he's happy to tell you that he came up with the idea for Lime during a vision quest at Burning Man. Burning Man has a lot of influence on me. There's no judgment, there's no money, rather that everyone peacefully together to make something magical happen. It's also a high density environment. 70,000 people and there's no car. It's just mind blowing. And I can see where Brad's coming from here. E-scooters are definitely a convenient way to traverse a flat, roadless desert on the search for some stinky festival box. But could they also be used on short city trips? Brad thought so, and so he dumped his first fleet of Lime e-scooters on Santa Monica streets in 2018. But they already had competition. By the time Lime arrived, birds were already crowding Santa Monica like some kind of Hitchcockian nightmare. Both companies launched in LA's tourism and homelessness hotspot as they saw the transport opportunity in a city without a center. And Bird's CEO, Travis van der Zandem, had a bold stratagem. Surely he who had the most scooters would inevitably become the scooter king. We would import these retail scooters off, off of Alibaba, and our team actually was hand soldering the, the GPS units that would go on top of the scooters in the actual WeWork. And we, would, we started with 10 out, out in front of the WeWork in Santa Monica, and people loved them, so every day we, were, we would scramble to hand solder more and get them out. Bird's first flock of e-scooters, though, didn't survive the mean streets of Santa Monica for long, with an average unit lasting all of 30 days. 
Regardless, Uber and Lyft smelt the stink of opportunity, quickly assembling their own brands and dumping them on Santa Monica's scooter-ridden streets too, where some citizens had finally had enough. I've been hit twice. I've got two herniated discs in my neck. I stepped out and one slammed right into me. Basically, pedestrians have become the bowling pins of Santa Monica. The city quickly limited the number of scooters allowed on the ground and gave preference to these new rideshare-backed competitors. Bird and Lime protested by making their scooters inaccessible during the vote to restrict their service. Like Hector Bello found out. Does it work? No. He eventually got this notice that all of Santa Monica is a no-ride zone. Yeah, that's right. We live in a world where the machines will actually go on strike on behalf of their startup overlords. It also really begs the question, can they turn off the scooters while you're riding them? If I was CEO, I'd have a big red button installed. Not to ever press it, I would just get off on the power of knowing I could. Techno dystopias aside, the scooters were actually doing the job they were meant to. More than 2.6 million e-scooter and e-bike trips were taken in Santa Monica in a single year, and they were mostly being used for short, work-related trips. Boosted by this success, scooters were soon piling up in Venice Beach, downtown and beyond. But could they work in cities with viable public transport, or where you can, like, walk places and stuff? Well, they were gonna have to if Bird and Lime were gonna live up to the billion dollar valuations they received after only one year in operation. This forced Bird and Lime to expand to other cities and countries as quickly as possible. But wherever the scooters landed, they were met with, uh, let's say, a few mixed responses. When Bird and half a dozen copycats migrated north to San Francisco, they quickly overwhelmed the city's puny, pedestrian-friendly sidewalks, forcing the city to ban e-scooters in May 2018, and only to bring them back in severely restricted numbers. Yeah, they're definitely a, a menace. Like, have some decency, like, move it to the side. Whoa, <laughs> While the scooters were banned in San Francisco, they were flying free in the neighboring city of Oakland. The problem was that they were flying straight into Lake Merritt. With the city fishing 60 fallen e-scooters out of the lake in October 2018 alone. Regardless, Lime and Bird both made it across the Atlantic in 2019, landing in the French city of Marseille. An attractive scooter dumping ground thanks to its large size and its year-round scooting temperatures which is like, you know, quite warm. Uncharacteristically though, the French enthusiastically resisted invasion, tossing e-scooters into the ocean like it was roll-on deodorant. Divers were forced to retrieve dozens of scooters per trip, leaving Katamari-style piles of broken scooters ready to rust on the dock. With Lime, Bird, and dozens of other competitors desperate to become the market leader, the war on e-scooters was being fought on a hundred different fronts across the world. So much so that documenting and posting your crimes against scooter kind basically became a worldwide trend. And uh, we think the exciting thing about that is, is how quickly uh, not just riders have uh, adopted the scooters, but, but actually cities have really embrace them. The citizens of New Zealand were particularly hostile to the arrival of e-scooters, probably confused by technology that couldn't be surfed or turned into pie. The city of Hamilton inflicted mass casualties on Lyme's first troops on the ground by laying waste to an average of eight scooters a week, bird scooters proving themselves to be flightless in every hemisphere. <laughs> All this vandalism, combined with the already short shelf life of the scooters themselves, meant that these firms were burning through their venture capital faster than a lithium-ion battery will burn through your carpet. Bird and Lime were both making huge losses, mostly owing to the costs of producing or buying these scooters and then replacing them every three months. 
But don't worry kids, this is 21st century capitalism. It's not a race to see who can make the most profitable company, it's a race to see who can make the biggest, market-leading, loss-making juggernaut who can then hoover up the assets of all its dead competitors at a discount. So to better weather the elements and to survive casual beatings, both Bird and Lime beefed up their base models. The average Bird scooter now only has a marginally shorter lifespan than a Spanish flea. About five months. The first problem that e-scooter friendly cities encounter is that people will just leave these things fucking anywhere, or knock them down like dominoes for fun. Even on the jumbo sidewalk streets of Santa Monica, the city has been forced to pass tedious legislation on where and when you can scoot. Street corners are covered in reminders that tell you not to scoot on the sidewalk, and scooter companies themselves geo-ring fence the scooters so they can't even be operated in certain areas. While the e-scooters themselves were getting drowned, burned, and bludgeoned, they were also inflicting casualties of their own. The fact is, these things are quite dangerous. But they become more dangerous when they are sharing narrow, crowded streets with a binge-drinking population. This is probably why the British were initially a bit skittish about granting the right to scoot to its population. Good afternoon, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you for stopping. That's partly why I'm riding this e-scooter in the metaverse. It's currently legal to buy and sell these scooters, but it is illegal to ride them anywhere other than on your private land. Oh! Which is what makes this ad read of questionable legal compliance. But that's okay, because I live on the edge. Or should I say... The Ridge. As soon as my spanking new Ridge wallet arrived, I knew I wouldn't need my bulky old leather one ever again. My bank cards are now protected with all the security that my brittle bones currently are not. Unlike this hunk of shit scooter or my femur, the Ridge wallet comes with a lifetime guarantee and comes in over 30 different colors and styles, including titanium. Wow! The Ridge wallet is the wallet of the future and it even slides comfortably in these jeans that I am um, shrunk in the wash. I am absolutely rigid for my new Ridge wallet. My Ridge wallet protects my driver's license, if I had one, and my debit cards, and weird coffee shop. Ooh, I am not handling this hill very well. <laughs> As I was saying before I was rudely interrupted by gravity, my Ridge wallet is the perfect wallet for all my card keeping needs. And if you want one too, all you need to do is follow the link below and use my coupon code ORDINARY for 10% off. Thanks Ridge. On paper, London might seem like the perfect e-scooter market. A large, urban city with a mostly carless population who will risk life and limb to avoid the fucking circle line at rush hour. Above ground though, the city's roads are narrow and rendered illogical after years of building on top of the parts that burnt down, got bombed out or lived in by poor people. Dockless e-scooter companies have only just been given permission to land and even then it's only in restricted spaces and only on trial schemes. Their three year absence though has led to widespread e-scooter ownership in the UK with British people either unaware or giving no shits about them being illegal to ride. But are the British right to be scooter skittish? Are these things safe? Well, luckily we can now find out by looking at all the data of the cities that have allowed these things to fly free. The BMJ conducted a scoping study looking at 28 other peer-reviewed studies of scooter injuries in different cities across the world. And it revealed a worrying trend. A high percentage of e-scooter injuries were head injuries, especially when compared with other mobility options like cycling. The essential and overlooked problem with e-scooters is in their basic design. Unlike a bike, you ride it standing up and therefore higher up. Meaning that if you fall off one of these things, you've got a longer way to fall and are more likely to go ass over tit. Wee. Scooters also lack the suspension of a bike, which insulates the rider from uneven or rough terrain. You can now attach a seat to some private e-scooters, but let's face it, if you're doing that, you've basically bought a turbo little rascal with one wheel missing. I would also argue, without any data, but with a basic grasp of human nature, that these dockless rental companies are creating an opportunity for a more impulsive model of scooter use. As in, glug glug, 
Scoop, scoop, smashy, smashy. In September 2019, Berlin opened their arms and craniums to e-scooters, allowing 11,000 units to have free reign in the city, providing us with an excellent sample size. Hey, what? What is los da? Scooter injuries in Berlin were found to be more common on weekends, and a significant cohort were helmet-free and intoxicated, or unfamiliar with the city. Now, are these companies responsible for the actions of those who use their service? No. Car manufacturers aren't liable for the actions of drunk drivers, but then again, they aren't dumping Toyotas in tourist spots with the keys in the ignition. But as far as Bird and Lime are concerned, these injuries are just martyrdoms in the holy war against our real enemy, the car. Uh, but Bird's mission is to remove cars from the road, reduce traffic, reduce carbon emissions. And so we want to be there to help, you know, riders across the world really kick the addiction to cars, whether it's, you know, sharing, renting by the month, owning. Uh, Burr platform, you know, we think all those things fit very nicely with our mission. Any environmental kudos that these companies lay claim to is immediately undercut by the short shelf life of these scooters, as well as the cost and carbon necessitated in their production and replacement. Even private e-scooters rarely live longer than two years and are hard to fix. When these Doppler scooters aren't being used by tourists, they are being used for short, work-related trips, mostly under three miles. Trips that could just as easily be taken by, say, a bike. For those unfamiliar, a bike is a 19th century invention that is both safer, healthier for you, doesn't fall apart in two years, and is actually environmentally friendly. They say that you can't reinvent the wheel, but if you're backed by enough venture capital cash, you sure can try. Wait a minute, he's on the, hi he's on the highway? Bruh, bruh. I'm going 50 right now, bruh! At the beginning of 2020, Lime had over 120,000 scooters occupying 30 countries. While the expansion hadn't been profitable, it had certainly been explosive. But just as Brad's strategy of spending his way to world domination looked like it was paying off, Covid came along and killed what little revenue they were making. Lime was forced to retreat or pause their campaign in the majority of the countries they were operating in. Meanwhile, in Bird's techno-dystopic virtual office, Travis was trying to treat his employees like his scooters by just turning them off. Over 400 employees had their laptop access deactivated right after a two-minute mass firing event conducted in a one-way Zoom call. One of those decisions is to eliminate a number of roles at the company. Unfortunately, your role is impacted by this decision, and Friday, April 3rd, will be your last day with Bird. As is the case for many businesses, the pandemic forced Bird to streamline. Bird is still operating in over 350 cities, and is now pivoting to sell their service as a socially distanced way of traveling, which is pretty smart. Gotta give them that. And it seems to have worked too with Travis bragging in the company's latest quarterly report that they are now losing less money than they were last year. With a net loss of just $37 million compared to the $44 million they lost last year, Bird is zooming towards losing even less money next year. Brad Bow, however, has taken a different approach, instead doubling down on venture capital, squeezing an extra $170 million worth of funding from Alphabet and Uber, alongside acquiring Uber's failed fleet of jump bikes. Still, both companies have fallen far short of their initial multi-billion dollar valuation, opening the market to new competitors. Even in their home base of Santa Monica, both Bird and Lime have now been mostly supplanted by new companies like the Ford-owned Spin. Although, if you go looking for them in West Hollywood, there are still as many birds lying around as there are homeless people shooting fentanyl between their toes. E-scooters are sort of a side effect of advances in lithium-ion batteries, which have only gotten cheaper and more efficient to a ludicrous extent over the last decade. These batteries will continue to create more innovations and more pathways towards greener transport options, which is super. But I would argue that dockless e-scooter rental companies are instead the product of a sunk cost fallacy, with those invested in their success heading towards profitability on the horizon with a half-depleted battery. What about e-scooters themselves, though? 
Well, experience is nine tenths of knowledge. And um, after riding around on one of these things myself, buying it purely for research purposes, there is one factor that's going to keep these things on the streets. They're fucking fun. They are relatively cheap, they glide real nice, they're easy to use, and they very, very rarely explode on public transport. They are so fun that British people, famous for doing what they're told, are breaking the law to ride them. And cities will generally find that legislating for their existence is a lot cheaper than filling the holes in their mass transit systems. So if you ask me, e-scooters will be checking shoulders and providing roadside dentistry on the cheap for years to come. Oh. E scooters. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>